Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here. Uh, welcome to another one of these Monday morning live streams. Um, we start off the week each Monday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, just kind of get you ready for the market uh, this this week. Show you some of the stock market news I'm watching, uh, some of the trends and strategies, and really get you started and uh, hopefully make you a better investor. So we're going to get started here because a lot to talk about, obviously, a uh, you know, what was actually a very good week last week. A lot of investors don't know that uh, stocks actually broke a three-week losing streak. If they had been down again last week, then uh, would have been four straight weeks and would have been the worst uh, worst stretch since 2012. So uh, very supportive, very positive for the market right there. But we're going to get into it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. I already see a lot of people in the chat there. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being a, a part of the nation, as we say, a part of the community. And uh, just make make sure, uh, let me make know that I'm coming in clear and, uh, and everything, and we'll get started here. Uh, before we do, though, I do want to uh, welcome you and and invite you personally to get the bow tie, um, the weekly bow tie. It's our free market newsletter. It goes out each Sunday night uh, before the market opens. To get you ready for the week. Really, a lot of kind of what we cover uh, on the mornings here. So get you first to, to get that information. Uh, you're going to find all that stock market news, trends, strategies that, that you need to know. All the stocks I'm watching and what I'm watching for that week. Uh, again, totally free. Look for the sign up link in the uh, chat window, or I'll put it in the description below as well. Uh, you can sign up. Get that uh, again. Get that sent out to your email Sunday nights before the market opens and get you ready. But uh, we're gonna get started because we got a lot to talk about. Uh, I want to get some Q and A in today as well. So uh, so let's get started. As I did say, you know the stock market managed to break that three week losing streak uh, last week. It did close up, although not very much. The Nasdaq was actually almost ex essentially flat. Uh, the other two indexes did a little bit better than that. And of course, no one wants to sound the all clear. You know, you watch the news, you watch other YouTubers, uh, some of the uh, some of the stock investing channels and, and things like that. And you know, it's always easier to give that generic advice, like uh, you know, the stock and the drop in stocks may be over and may not. You know, nobody wants to go out on a limb. But uh, you know, I will go out on a limb and say I think the worst is over uh, for the sell off. Could be wrong. I don't think I am. You know, just looking at the economy and, and looking at some other data points that we can go over. But the underlying economy is very strong. Okay, we've got 3.9% uh, unemployment rate, which 3.5% uh, is the record low, and so it's very close to the record low. Uh, we're going to get a new jobs number out on Friday that I think could could make that even lower. Uh, we've got uh, something like 11 million, 10.6 million jobs available for only about 8 million people actually actively looking for work in the labor force there. So uh, more jobs than than people uh, than than workers. Uh, we've got rising wages. We've got consumer spending that is still looking very strong. Uh, people are working through some of those savings that they put together through the pandemic. Uh, savings savings rate was at an all time high during the pandemic. They saved up a lot of money. Uh, at one point, J.P. Morgan was saying households had something like two trillion dollars in excess savings that they had saved during the pandemic. So. You know, corporate balance sheets are very strong. Consumer household spending uh, is very strong. The economy is very strong. That is just not the environment where you get a full-blown stock market crash. Now, stocks are still expensive on a relative basis, uh, you know, and we'll look at some of the numbers for that. But, you know, that's not necessarily a reason for stocks to crash. Okay, stocks don't crash just because they get expensive. They need a catalyst. And then they need some of those underlying weaknesses in the fundamentals. You know, so we have seen uh, what could amount, what is really a crash in some of those growth stocks, the biotech stocks, uh, but that's not really a market crash. Okay, what we're talking about here is an overall market crash. So we're going to talk about kind of the difference between those growth stocks, that uh, area of the market, as well as the general market. Uh, but again, you know, I do not think, uh, I do not see a crash coming for this. Uh, so if you take that into consideration, you know, we're down 15% on the NASDAQ. Uh, around 10% on the S&P 500, uh, that is a correction. You know, so we have now corrected from some of that bubble territory uh, that we had at, at the close of last year, and we're a little bit more uh, more attractively valued. You know, to get for that to get much worse into 15 and 20 and uh, percent down and more, uh, you do need that that crash scenario, and I just don't see it. 
I think once we get into that first rate hike in March, okay, so obviously the big news lately has been the Fed is going to start increasing rates. They're going to start pulling back some of that stimulus that they pushed into the economy over the last year and a half. And that's weighing on stocks because it was easy money. It was the historically easy money, uh, you know, the most, the easiest money we've ever seen, really. The Fed increased its balance sheet by about $5 trillion. And what that means is, it pushed out about $5 trillion out in the economy to support the economy, you know, through uh, through bond buying. Of course, the federal government did the same with uh, their own stimulus programs and stuff like that. So you had a massive amount of money heading into the economy, really boosting up uh, the economy and stocks uh, stocks as well. Uh, and now we're, we're seeing that come out or we're, we're planning on that being uh, taken out. So that's really what's weighed on uh, the stock market. Okay, the stock market is forward looking. So it's always going to look out, uh, you know, about six months into the future and kind of use its uh, collective crystal ball to uh, to see what's happening. Right. And OK, so so the stock market and investors collectively, they see higher interest rates. They see less economic stimulus. Uh, so they see kind of a slowdown in stocks. And that's why that's why they're selling stocks. OK, um, but I think what generally happens a lot of times, especially with these Fed rate hikes, when Fed, when the Federal Reserve right, rate rises or increases its own rates, um, you know, and of course that takes all other interest rates with it, um, then you get that sell off before that in anticipation. OK, because, again, the stock market and investors are forward looking They're They're going to be saying, OK, you know what? The Fed is going to raise rates. That's going to be bad for stocks. So I'm going to sell now. Well, what happens, though, is when we actually get to that that event, you know, it's it's called uh, what we usually call buy the or sell the rumor, buy the news. Right. Or sometimes it's buy the rumor, sell the news. Uh, in this case, it's sell the rumor, you know, sell the anticipation and buy the news, because I think once we do get to those uh, rate hikes, the market's going to see and investors are going to see that, you know what, uh, rates are still historically low. Even if the Fed does raise rates, I have saw, saw some uh, economic data just over the or analysis just over the last week that estimates that the Fed could rate, hike, hike rates all the way up to 4%. Okay, rates are now at zero to, to a quarter of a percent. Okay, almost z pretty much zero flat, right? Um, the Fed could hike rates all the way to 4% before it would s start to... Um, start to hold back economic growth. Okay. And, you know, so, so usually the Fed raises rates by a quarter of a percent. Sometimes they go a little bit uh, further and do it by half a percent. Uh, but even at that, even if they do a half a percent in March, uh, you know, they've still got three and a half percent. They've still got, you know, upwards of uh, six or seven or eight uh, rate hikes left before it really starts hurting the economy. So again, what I think happens is we get to March, we get to those rate hikes, and then you get the, the collective, sigh, you click the collective sigh of relief from the market saying, OK, we're into rate hike cycle. But it's not going to hurt stocks. It's not going to hurt the economy because we do have uh, we do have very strong economic growth uh, and rates are still low. You know, despite the Fed raising rates, they're still low and it's not going to be it's still going to be supportive of economic growth. So I do think, uh, you know, I do think the next uh, month or so could be, you know, volatile, flat. And we'll talk about why that's actually normal anyway. Uh, but then, you know, once we get into March and the second half of the year could look start looking a little bit better as that economic growth kicks in and uh, it really reasserts itself. Um, getting into uh, the markets today, it does look like it's going to be a, a, a mixed uh, kind of a mixed open today. It looks like the Nasdaq futures are up slightly about a quarter of a percent. Uh, S&P futures are down, uh, you know, 0.17 percent, which is basically flat, you know, uh, this is uh, that's really basically no move. So we'll really have to see kind of how the market opens uh, off of that. But uh, again, you know, the market uh, closed higher for the uh, to, to break that three week losing streak last week. Uh, but it wasn't after stressing investors the hell out over the busy five days. Right. You know, at one point Monday, tech stocks in the Nasdaq were down 19 percent from the peak. So just a percent from that definition of a bear market. OK, so what we what we usually say is 10 percent down from the peak, right? 10 percent down from the the re excuse me, the recent all, all time high is a correction. You know, stocks are in correction territory. And we see that in the Nasdaq. And we actually saw that last week in the S&P 500, that broader market index uh, was down more than 10% uh, from the peak. So they were in correction territory, but they were not a crash. They were not a bear market. Okay. What we generally say is down 20% from the all time high from the recent peak. That is a bear market. That is a, um, that is a crash. OK. And so we were at, at one point on Monday. The Nasdaq was very close to that within one percent. 
uh, and you kind of got that sense of capitulation. And we'll talk about what that is. Uh, but that's when basically everyone just gives up in stock, sells everything. Uh, and, and of course, you know, if everybody, if all the sellers have sold their stocks, then there's only buyers left. Uh, so that is a good sign for the market. What happened that, that day was a really interesting, really supportive of stocks. We actually went from 5% down on Monday in the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ at one point was 5% down for the day, actually um, jumped back up to about 1%, uh, close 1% down. So regained a lot of territory. And I think that was very supportive of the market because you had that capitulation and then you had investors come back in and say, hey, you know what? The economy is still strong. There's probably won't be a crash. This is probably the worst it's going to get. So you had investors coming back into the market and uh, and buying. Now, the rest of the week was kind of a series of head fakes, right? You had uh, the, the market either open higher and then close lower or it opened lower and closed higher. So it was very much uh, volatile, uh, but which is actually very normal for uh, four stocks. You had uh, you had oil continue to be the strength of the market. And we'll look at some of the uh, the sectors here pretty soon. Uh, kind of show you what happened in the market there. Let's let's go ahead and do that now. So here is the sector tracker on sectorspider.com. Of course, is one of my favorite resources just to see kind of get a feel for what the market is doing and and what sectors of the economy are doing really well kind of give give you that high level. Uh, where am I here? Okay, I don't know why I'm not in the uh, in the box there. Oh, maybe it's over here. Nope. Anyway, don't know why I'm not showing up in the video box in the corner, but uh, but you get a, a nice look at the the background there. Uh, anyway, yeah, like to look at the sector tracker here in the uh, in the sectorspider.com gives you that broad, high level view of uh, what is happening uh, in the market and kind of how to position. Uh, and of course, we saw last week the S&P 500 did close up about three quarters of a percent. Uh, the energy space up five percent. And if we go further out here year to date, energy is now up 18 and a quarter percent. You know, the only sector uh, oil stocks are the only sector in the economy that is uh, that is positive territory for the year. And what a positive territory it is. 18 uh, percent. We'll actually talk a little bit more about that next in kind of a trend that I see uh, developing for for energy stocks. Of course, the uh, the technology stocks also did relatively well. You know, uh, technology, the XLK uh, did 2.38 percent higher last week. That was really kind of a rebound off of uh, you know a really poor start to the to the to the year. Consumer discretionary down one and a quarter percent, 1.29 percent uh, right here. You know, uh, those retail names sold off. I think a lot of that was uh, kind of uh, you know people selling out of some of the Omicron hit stuff, some of the little bit more expensive stuff. It was interesting that cyclicals, materials and industrials uh, sold off as well. Now, one thing, uh, one thing we, we do want to look at is, uh, is, you know, oil, oil continues to be the, the strong point of the market. Uh, crude was up last week, uh, percent 1.5 percent to $87 a barrel. It's actually, I think it's up uh, today uh, as well. Looks like a little over 87, 87.50 a barrel. Um, energy stocks top performers for several weeks and for the uh, for the year up 18 percent, you know, and and I think you, you need to be careful here because I mean, come on, 18 percent increase in what amounts to about four weeks. Uh, it also had a very strong year last year. I think energy was actually the top performance uh, sector last year. Um, and we benefited from it. You know, we were heavily weighted in energy stocks in the uh, the Bowtie Nation, the 2021 Bowtie Nation portfolio. Uh, we've still got some of those in the 2022 portfolio. Uh, so benefiting from that, but an 18% uh, increase in four weeks is a little much. You know, I still really like this sector, and, and we've been talking about that. We've been talking about why uh, over the last couple of weeks. You know, just a wave of cash flow into these stocks. Uh, we saw a little bit of selling last week, and I in Chevron. You know, Chevron reported its earnings last week. I think we get Exxon Mobil this week, uh, and what we saw with Chevron is very good numbers, very strong cash flow, but the stock sold off a little bit from that kind of overbought uh, area, from that technical, uh, technically overbought. Uh, territory, right? So I think we started to see kind of a trend that could play out over the next three or four weeks or, or, or even a little bit longer, where 
still very strong cash flow from these companies. Earnings come out very good because, you know, at who's not making money at $87 a barrel in oil? You know, so these these energy companies, these oil stocks are making a tremendous amount of comp money. They're not really spending it like they used to. You know, they used to have to spend billions and billions of dollars every quarter, um, you know, trying to uh, keep their oil wells going and develop and, and explore for new ones. They're not doing that quite as much anymore because, you know, the, the oil demand out five years, five plus years from now isn't going to be as strong. Strong, right, so they're not spending. That means tons of cash flow that they're now returning to shareholders. Uh, we saw Energy Transfer increase its dividend last week. We saw Chevron increase its dividend last week. I think you're going to see that across all the oil stocks, increasing their dividends, increasing their buyback programs, their share buyback programs. So that's going to be supportive of the stocks, but they are extremely expensive right here. Uh, after 18% just in the past four weeks, uh, I think you do start to see some profit taken on those stocks. So what I would be doing, I wouldn't be selling any of my oil stocks, okay, and I'm not selling any of my oil, oil stocks because I want those dividends, right? I think the the year is very supportive of that sector. I think it does very well. Uh, and I think you collect a lot of dividends on those stocks. But the near term, I am looking for a, kind of a near term correction in some of these names. You know, so what I might do is sell some covered calls against these. Uh, and I can show you just uh, kind of what I'm talking about there. If you don't know, uh, if we go to, you know, something like uh, Chevron CVX, uh, which is actually is one of my favorite oil stocks there. They've got a very low cost of production, right? And we do see it fell 3.5% Friday. It's down pre-market this week, despite those oil prices going up, right? Oil prices up six tenths of a percent, and yet an oil one of the largest oil companies is down eight tenths, uh, almost nine tenths of a percent. And again, I think that is because you're starting to see some of that profit taking in the space. Okay, so what I would want to do, because I still want to collect that 4.4% dividend yield, then I would keep my stock, keep my shares, but I would go to the options and I would sell covered calls against that. And I would do near term. Okay, whenever you go to uh, options, any options uh, page that you've got on your on your investing platform, you can go out here and pick which month, which week even that you want the options on. And I think I would go as far out as maybe even... Uh, you know, maybe even June, maybe maybe March or April. You know, not too far out, uh, but definitely not not the whole year. Uh, and then so so maybe you go to uh, maybe you go to June, okay. And then uh, so Chevron is trading for one hundred thirty dollars. Uh, you know, there might be some upside still available, some upside. So maybe a 135, 140. Uh, and what would what would happen here is I would sell these one hundred forty dollars strike calls uh, for the June expiration, okay, and I would get, you know, for each share that I sold those on, uh, I would get about 435. So the market isn't pricing in today's yet, but but $4.35 a share uh, for each share, if the market is if the stock is 130 right now. So 435 divided by 130. So I would collect basically about a 3.3% premium 3.3% in cash on that position, uh, you know, to uh, to sell those shares. Um, and it wouldn't be selling the shares. Basically, what would happen is if those shares went above 140 by June, then that investor that bought those call options from me could buy them for $140. So I basically lock in uh, a limit to $140 on my shares, right? Which actually, you know, if they go up to 140 in six months, uh, that is already besides the the return that I've already booked. You know, since I've held I've held the shares for quite a while, but besides the the recent return that I've already booked. If they go up to 140 by June, that's still a 7.7 percent, 7.7 percent return. Okay, in six months, 7.7 percent plus I got get that 3.3 percent uh, on the call option. So 3.3 plus 77 plus uh, I get half the year of dividends, right? And it pays 2.3 percent, so I get about 2.1 percent. So my uh, I kind of uh, my my upper limit for return on this is 13% in six months though it's six months I collect 13% uh, now if the stock does not go to 140 then that investor isn't going to buy those shares from me for 140 dollars they're going to buy them in the market for less you know so I'm going to keep those shares and keep his money that he paid me I'm going to keep that four dollars and thirty five cents per share that he paid me for that option, right? So it uh, it lowers my risk a little bit because I collected that money on the shares. It uh, it keeps some some return intact, and uh, and it's really a great way to keep those dividend stocks, but lower your risk that uh, that that some of that money comes out. Okay. Uh, let's turn it over to uh, kind of what I'm watching for in stocks this week. Uh, 
you know, and before we get started, we really have to talk about what's normal for a stock market. You know, I think a lot of investors kind of need a reality check, especially the, the new investors that have just started over the past uh, couple of years, kind of been spoiled on that, uh, that consistent rise higher. You know, uh, over, the last, over the last two years, you know, right after the pandemic or right after the big crash during the pandemic, uh, it, the, the stock market has basically been looking like uh, scaling the Himalayas, right? You know, it's kind of a little bit jagged there, but, but it's basically just kind of a straight up walk uh, all the way up to, to stock prices. And that is not normal. Okay, we are now getting into normal where the stock market actually looks more like an EKG meter. Okay, uh, you know, you, you, you get your, your heart, uh, your heart tested, and it's up and down and up and down and up and down. Um, and, and that's normally what the stock market looks like. Okay, you, you have to be ready for that. You cannot get stressed out by this market, because this is normal. Okay, normally, you see at least uh, on average, two uh, corrections per year. That's uh, five to 10% down in stocks from, from the recent highs. Uh, a lot of times you'll even get, uh, you know, higher ones, higher corrections, 10 to 15%. And we typically get a, uh, even a bull bear market, you know, a crash of 20% or more uh, every, every three or four years. Okay. So, uh, so the, the market is generally much more volatile than we've been seeing over the year and a half. This is totally normal. You cannot get scared out of this market. You cannot let other YouTubers scare you out of this market. We'll talk about that uh, here in a little bit, you know, but, uh, but I see a lot of YouTubers selling everything, selling all their stocks. Uh, and you got to understand where they're coming from and why they're doing this, because it is, has nothing to do with good investing. It has everything to do with them making money on those videos uh, and nothing to do with good investing advice. So do not let them, do not let the market scare you out of this market because I think there's some real opportunities still here, uh, here in the market. Now for this week though, we are looking at a very strong uh, or a very big earnings week, which it's too bad because uh, normally earnings really drives the market. And uh, I think they could be very supportive of stocks uh, this week. But of course the market, the investors really aren't focusing on earnings this, uh, this quarter. You know, um, we have seen about a third of the stocks of the companies in the S&P 500 report earnings already. 77% uh, of them are beating their beating the expectations for earnings, uh, actually reporting an average of 24.3% earnings growth over the past year, which uh, would mark the fourth consecutive quarter of 20% uh, plus earnings growth. Very strong, very supportive of stocks. Uh, and this is really this is really supporting the market. I do want to share uh, another a graph here, kind of show you show you how this how this is affecting the market. Uh, so we we do see uh, you know weakness in the market. Stocks are still relatively expensive, but if you look at the uh, the price to earnings ratio, and this is uh, FactSet Earnings Insight, another great tool for for research and uh, resource. But this is the forward 12-month PE ratio, and we can look at the uh, the, the regular PE ratio as well. Uh, they show that here. And we'll look at we'll look at that one. We'll look at the trailing PE ratio. The difference really in these are the forward PE ratio is forward earnings. Okay, so it's the price of stocks in the market. Here it's the stocks in the S and P 500 index. So the uh, the the price of all those stocks in the index uh, together, and then the forward earnings are what analysts expect all those companies to report here here in the next year forward the forward 12 months right so it's the current price divided by forward expected earnings uh the regular pe ratio the, the trailing pe ratio the one you usually hear about most of the time especially since uh, since stocks started coming down you know and, and earnings really started coming up you know like i said we've had four straight quarters of 20 percent plus earnings growth which is huge you know average earnings growth usually closer to about uh, 10 to 15 percent at the most 20 percent four straight quarters of uh, 20 percent earnings growth and while stocks were coming up uh you know prices were increasing their uh last last year into november um they they weren't increasing as fast as earnings growth so what we saw here was okay so for a pe ratio price to earnings ratio right you've got two parts of it you got the price you got the stock prices and then you got earnings so it was really super high but then earnings that bottom part of the ratio started taking off companies started reporting historically high earnings very high and, and really brought that pe ratio down to uh, you know down to where it's been historically okay at one point the pe ratio was like 36 times which is hugely expensive uh, but now it, you know as those earnings get reported higher and as stocks came down over the past month or two then we're actually down to this five-year average which was still pretty expensive you know five-year average is about 23 times on a pe basis we are now down to that now uh, the 10-year average is a little bit lower here still at 20 times 
on a on a PE basis, you know, on a PE multiple. But uh, it just shows you that, you know, for all the uh, for all the talk of stock market crashes and uh, expensive stocks and all that, stocks really aren't uh, have come down. They really aren't quite as expensive as I think a lot of people think. They've come down to that five year ratio, five year average. Uh, they could come down further to uh, to the ten year average, even down further a little bit to the uh, to the longer term. But uh, but again, the underlying economy is very strong. Consumers are very strong. So uh, so there's not re necessarily a reason or a catalyst that stocks would come down even further than than what they already are right now. Uh, so so that's what we're looking at for earnings. We can look at some of the stocks reporting earnings this week and the stocks I'm watching. Uh, but still, you know, uh, earnings are expected to slow down a little bit. Earnings growth is expected to be 9% for the full year this year, 2022, 10% for next year. So a little bit more normal earnings growth. But that is still supportive of stocks because, again, that P.E. ratio, as you get earnings go up, then that's that uh, that brings the P.E. ratio down. Right. So we're already at the five year average. Uh, if stocks prices don't take off again, if they if they stay flat or even come down just a little bit, then that's going to that's going to bring them down to that 10 year average, which uh, would be very attractive, a very attractive spot for the market and by no means that bubble territory that we had uh, last year. Uh, Something to usually watch this week, uh, the monthly jobs report comes out on the first Friday of every month. So of course, this Friday, we've got the monthly jobs report, the uh, employment situation report comes out. Um, usually talk about this. This is usually a big deal for the market. Probably not this week, this month, right? Uh, they're going to be reporting January's numbers uh, The and how they do that report. I used to work as an economist for the state of Iowa. I used to put together this uh, things for this labor report. And uh, the way they do their report, they do a survey on usually the, the second, second or third week, second week of the month uh, that, it, that it measures, right? So last January, about the second week, around the 12th, uh, they did a survey of households and businesses. How many people did you hire last uh, how many people did you hire uh, this month, right? Or over the last month? You know, did you get a new job this over the last month? Things like that. Uh, and well, of course, what was happening last month, right around the 12th of January? Omicron was blowing the doors off the COVID rate, right? Off the COVID uh, infections, you know? And we talked about this last month when we were talking about the jobs report. Jobs report was disappointing last month. I think it's gonna be disappointing this month as well uh, because, you know, people really had no incentive. With Omicron just surging, a lot of companies sending their people back home uh, to work from home, things like that. Nobody was hiring. Nobody was really looking for a job. So uh, any economists are, are expecting that, right? So nobody's really talking about the jobs report for Friday because everybody expects it to be extremely low. Nobody expects anything out of it. What we will start seeing though, and this is very important for the market, is uh, you know after this month, so in the March jobs number, March, uh, March, April, May, you're gonna start, I think you're gonna start seeing some very good numbers from these jobs reports, right? People are starting to run out of money. Yeah, I saw uh, some, some analysis a couple months ago that said, you know, people, households, the average household uh, with under $25,000 uh, net worth, you know, so, so most households would start running out of that pandemic stimulus money uh, and the savings that they had built up over the pandemic by February, by January and February. That's going to force a lot of people to, uh, to go back to work, right? Uh, you know, they were, they, they were staying home. They didn't really need to work because uh, they had all these savings saved up. Um, you know, through last year, they, you know, they couldn't get evicted. A lot of people just didn't want to go back to work, right? So they didn't. And you see a lot of the jobs, the problems we've had with the jobs uh, number, those 10.6 million jobs available for only 8 million people actually looking for work. Uh, you know, you've got very low jobs numbers, but I think you start to see that turn around here in, uh, you know, March, April, May, you start seeing those jobs numbers really pick up. You start seeing the unemployment rate come down. And more importantly, you start seeing the labor force participation rate jack up a, a lot, right? That's been a, a big hindrance to the job market. Um, people just dropping out of the labor force, not, not even looking for work, right? So you've got that Eight, 8 million people unemployed, right? But there's actually, you know, another three or 4 million people that are just not even looking for work. They're not even in the labor force. So they're not counted in that. I think you start seeing them come back into the labor force, looking for jobs, taking jobs because they have to. Uh, and I think that's really going to be supportive of economic growth as well as consumer spending. You know, uh, people are, people are working, they're going to spend their money. Okay. If they're, you know, if they're not working, if they're living off their savings, they're going to be a little bit cautious about spending that money, you know, right. But uh, when they do co go back to work, Work, they come to a long uh, a long week of work and they want to spend that money. So they're going to be spending money that's going to be supportive of consumer spending, uh, going to be uh, supportive of the economy. And I think it's 
really going to be supportive of stocks. So be watching for that March, April, May jobs reports. I think those are going to be really important uh, for, for the market. We're not going to see very much of the Fed commentary this week, which uh, could also be supportive of stocks. Obviously, the big question mark has been, you know, how fast is the Fed going to raise rates? How fast is going to, the Fed going to, uh, you know, let its balance sheet run off and stop supporting the economy? Um, and we don't get a whole lot of commentary from Fed members of the Fed this week. Okay, uh, we just had the the meeting last week. They said what they need to say. We've got a few Fed members uh, talking in different speeches this week, but not very much that much. So I think it could take the focus off of rates, which would be good. You know, uh, the the market has been entirely too focused on interest rates over the last uh, over the last month, really. Uh, and uh, so taking the taking the focus off of rates is a good thing. Uh, now let's look at some stocks I'm watching this week. A lot of earnings. A lot of earnings coming out this week. I want to start, though, actually start with a couple of the stocks that I actually bought last week. Uh, one of the stocks I bought, actually, I've owned owned Groupon for about a year now, owned about 1,000 shares of Groupon, added another 1,500 shares last week uh, on some really some, some surprising news. Turns out Groupon actually owns a 5% investment, 5% stake in a UK payments company called SumUp, okay? And SumUp is now, uh, you know, looking for funding. It's going to, to some of the private equity. It's a private company. Um, it's going to, you know, some of the hedge funds and, and uh, private equity and uh, venture capital and, and all that, looking for funding at a valuation of about $20 billion, okay? And this is really weird that we, we haven't heard anything about this investment that Groupon has for like almost a decade. You know, Groupon made this investment in 2012, bought into this company for about 5% uh, stake into it uh, and hasn't really talked about it since then, you know, hasn't had it on the, uh, you know, on the, in the financial reports and the annual reports, hasn't said anything about it, but they still, you know, presumably they still do still have this 5% stake in there. Now, so if sum up is worth, and this is what the big news that came out last week that drove Groupon up 23% on, uh, you know, on Thursday, drove Groupon shares up 23% last week that if sum up is if sum up is valued at $20 billion that 5% stake alone is worth $1.1 billion to Groupon okay so if you kind of go through the numbers here uh, if Groupon has an investment worth $1.1 billion we see the market cap and the market cap market capitalization is the total value of all the shares of Groupon in the market is only $801 million so it's uh, it's really kind of a market mispricing if uh, you know if Groupon has this investment that's worth 1.1 billion dollars and let's say even let's say even uh, Groupon can only get 750 million dollars out of this investment you know they maybe they they try to sell this sell their stake to a, a private equity firm or a venture capital firm or what have you right say they can only get 750 million dollars out of that. That's 750 million. They've actually Groupon actually has 50 million dollars in net cash on their balance sheet. Okay, all their cash that they have on on reserve minus the debt that they owe is 50 million dollars net cash. 50 million dollars of free cash. So we add those together, 750 million dollars from this uh, sum up investment plus 50 million. That is the entire market cap. That is the entire uh, stock value of Groupon right now. 800 million dollars. Right then, you got just the the Groupon business. You know how much is that worth? What's their free cash flow worth and everything? So, gen, I think you know this company, these shares could be double what it's trading for. You know, if you've got if you've got a 750, 800, 900 million dollar uh, investment plus what the stock is is trading for right now, you know, because again. People just really weren't even thinking about that sum up investment. It wasn't being reported. It wasn't being talked about. So you know you've got you've got potentially a 1.6 billion dollars, even two billion dollar uh, company here trading for 800 million dollars. So you know we saw that big jump last week. Here's that uh, you know last week it, it was up 23 percent. Gave back some of that uh, you know in a Thursday Friday session. It's up three percent this week. I still think I, I still think this is you know a good stock to own if it is you know I think it could easily go up to 35 40 dollars uh, you know just just on some of the other things we've talked about. You know I've talked about Groupon over the last couple of weeks. It's got a new deal with Google where Google uh, users Google Pay users can uh, can access Groupon deals. Um, obviously, Groupon is not the stock, not the company it used to be, not the uh, the the you know the big uh, the big uh, the big uh, coupon uh, coupon deals stock that it used to be. But it is worth something, 
And I think that one's going to be one that surprises you this, uh, you know, this year. Uh, SoFi Technologies, ticker SOFI, is another stock I added this week, kind of selectively picking up some of those growth names hit over the past year, okay? And this is really what I want to talk about as far as what we're seeing in the market why, uh, you know, what is what is attractive in this market? You know, I still think some of the uh, some of the the general market is still a little bit expensive, especially some of those very mega cap tech names like your Fang, like your Facebook, your Apple, uh, you know, your your Netflix and Google, things like that are still fairly expensive. But you look into some of these growth stocks, these stocks that are down 60 and 70 percent over the last year. Uh, these are still, you know, the companies of tomorrow, the companies that are changing our world, and they're starting to look very attractive. Okay, uh, SoFi Technologies is a uh, kind of a, a digital fintech, a financial technology company. They make loans, they do, uh, you know, they do lending, it's basically an online bank. They actually got a big bump last week from... Um, they, they reported that they had actually gotten a bank license, okay, so they can now start doing some of the more traditional banking uh, relationships and things like that, actually sold that, sold off on, uh, you know, later, we'll have to go a month out, so you can see here this big jump here, uh, January, January 19th, surged on the report of that banking license, but then ended up giving that back, you know, because of the sell-off in uh, growth stocks, so right, so over the past year, I mean, it has really sold off, uh, you know, with growth stocks, but it's it's actually had some good news. You know, every once in a while, they'll they'll report something really good, some earnings or that banking license, and and the the stock will pop. So it's it's some really strong supportive uh, supportive areas for the stock. And and generally, you know, I mean, I think I think SoFi is the future of banking, right? It's that digital, that digital finance, uh, digital financial services that we are all moving into uh, within the next ten years. It's your your bank is going to be totally online, and I think SoFi is very well positioned for that future of banking. Okay, analysts are expecting thirty to fifty percent revenue growth to continue for years. It is now trading, you know, after this huge sell-off over the last year, it's now trading at just six times the expected revenue for this year. You know, it's almost a third of its post-IPO peak, right? Uh, it did IPO, uh, I think, just last year, in fact. Uh, it made it up to about $25, $26, uh, you know, after the IPO. It's now trading for uh, $11 a share, up 1% today. Uh, and, and again, I think, you know, this is this is the future of banking. They've got a very good position. It's now trading very attractively priced. And, uh, you know, something something I think you want to look at. You know, a lot of these growth stocks that, that uh, just took off over the last couple of years, now down 60%, 70% from their peaks and and definitely starting to look attractive. I think something that, that you need to be looking at. Uh, another stock I'm looking at, NXP Semiconductors, uh, actually reports uh, today. That's ticker NXPI that reports its earnings today. And, and investors will be firmly watching what management says about that semiconductor shortage, right? Uh, that semiconductor shortage is really contributing to a lot of the inflation we've seen, okay? Inflation in cars, inflation in consumer electronics. Uh, so if it if it looks like if we get any kind of news or hints or clues to this that shortage is going to be clearing, which I do think by the end of the year that semiconductor shortage is going to be not necessarily a thing of the past, but is going to be very much uh, very much better, very much cleared. Uh, then that's going to be a positive catalyst for a lot of segments of the consumer market, including autos, including consumer electronics, including a lot of these, and it's going to ease some of those inflation worries, right? It's going to we're going to start seeing that inflation pressure in that part of the market come out, okay? We're still gonna see a lot of inflation in rents and wages, things like that, that are still gonna keep inflation high, but we're, we're gonna start seeing parts of that inflation picture come off and, and that's gonna be supportive of the market because of course, you know, the market is singularly focused on inflation right now and what it means for interest rates, okay? so. So be watching NXP Semiconductor, what they say, what management says about the semiconductor shortage when it reports earnings uh, today. Another one I'm watching here, Al Alphabet, Google, right? Ticker G-O-O-G. -O -O it's going to start the big tech earnings season on Tuesday, tomorrow. It's expected to report a 23% jump in its earnings, 27.50 a share, along with a 27% increase in revenue uh, when it's compared to Q4 of last year. But now the thing is with Alphabet, I think, and I love the company. Uh, I think you know, they've got so much there. Basically, I think I think with Alphabet, you kind of get a lottery ticket investment, right? You get uh, when you buy the shares of Alphabet here at twenty six, twenty seven hundred dollars, you're basically getting uh, all the the big revenue drivers, right? You're getting the ads, you're getting YouTube, you're getting everything Alphabet owns. 
baked into that stock price. But what is not baked into this stock price, I think, is kind of their their investments, their other investments, right? And I think they report these as other investments uh, on their in their financial reports. So these are things like the self driving. These are things like you know Waymo and and things like that. That really, you know, the the future cash flows are so far out that analysts and, and investors really aren't putting much value on those just yet. But if they do take off, you know, if Waymo does take off, if some of these other, uh, you know, AI, artificial intelligence, and, and some of these other other investments do take off, you should get a big bump in your shares of Alphabet. Now that said, I do think expectations are very high right now for those shares. They're already trading at a very expensive seven times full year expected sales. Okay. So, so the analysts, uh, Analyst expected sales for 2022 for Google, uh, the stock is already trading at seven times that, with it, which is very expensive for a stock that, yes, is growing earnings by about 20, 20 to 30% a year, but it's a little on the high side, right? I think the downside might, might actually be a little larger than the upside on its earnings report tomorrow. Uh, growth in many of these key drivers to the company, like ad revenue and YouTube, is expected to slow this year. Okay, so you've got the, the main ad revenue uh, could slow down a little bit this year. It's probably going to be growth, but not quite as as much growth. YouTube is getting a lot of uh, a lot of competition from TikTok. Okay, so I think that is going to slow uh, ad revenue and and growth revenue growth at YouTube. I think that's something the the market hasn't priced in yet. Uh, so I think that's going to be kind of a downside negative to the stock. Obviously, cloud the the cloud side of the business, cloud services has should do well. It's done well for a lot of other stocks already reporting the, in the market. So I think cloud the cloud business could support the stock, but I think those uh, those downside possibilities, those, the potential and uh, downside to YouTube and ad revenue, probably a little bit too much. And and I would be kind of uh, I'd be worried about shares of Google uh, when they report tomorrow. But we'll have to see. We'll have to see what they report. Uh, PayPal. PayPal is another one that reports uh, Tuesday. It's also one of my largest holdings. You know, uh, again, in that fintech digital finances space, I think that is the future. Uh, you know, that is the future of our banking and financial services. I don't think these uh, a lot of these stocks are really you know building that into the stock price just yet. Uh, it is probably going to report lower revenue from cryptocurrency trading, and that's going to weigh on the results. Uh, earnings are expected only 3.7% higher on a year-over-year -year basis, right? So not uh, not really high expectations. Uh, revenue growth of 13% to 6.9 billion. Um, revenue growth is expected 18% higher for this year. So still very much in that 20% plus range that that PayPal is targeting as far as annual revenue growth. Uh, and, and you know, I would I would be listening to commentary on the company's Venmo integration with Amazon. Okay, so just just this year started. Uh, People on Amazon, buyers on Amazon, can now use their Venmo app, which is the uh, the PayPal digital digital wallet, right? You know, kind of digital banking there on PayPal, the Venmo app. They can now use that to pay for things on Amazon. So, new deal just started this year could significantly add to user growth. Probably won't add quite so much to revenue, uh, just because I think Amazon is probably taking a big cut of that uh, because they can because it's Amazon. Uh, but but it could add to uh, user growth. And that's what's really important for Venmo, for that digital wallet and for PayPal right now. Because again, as we move closer into that fully uh, fully immersed digital wallet, right? You've got your digital wallet in Venmo. They start selling you these banking services, lending, mortgages, you know, insurance, all those other financial services, as well as you know some advertising. This that Venmo app becomes extremely valuable to PayPal. So they're just adding users right now. That's what they're focused on, and I think this Amazon deal really helps to do that this year. So again, PayPal, one of my largest holdings, uh, and one that, that that I'm investing in. Another one I'm watching, Spotify. Actually, a good rebound today, 4.6%. They report their earnings on Wednesday. I've obviously been having a lot of a lot of issues lately with uh, kind of some some of the things Joe Rogan has been talking about on his podcast. Uh, you know, misinformation and that uh, some of the musicians taking their their music off of uh, off of Spotify uh, in protest, and, and they just came out with news. You know, yesterday that they're going to address that. They're, uh, you know, obviously they're talking to Joe Rogan, probably trying to get him to say a few things about it. Uh, they're actually um, going to be labeling podcasts that, that have any kind of misinformation. They're going to be labeling those. And uh, so, so that's why you see this pop. The thing that worries me about Spotify though, is I wonder if we're going to hear the same themes that we saw from Netflix. Okay. If you don't remember Netflix, uh, 
issued its earnings report last week, huge drop in the shares uh, initially. I think, uh, you know, afterwards, I, I think we got some some news that Bill Ackman was buying shares. And so that that contributed to a pop in the shares. But initially on that earnings report, we saw a huge, huge slowdown in subscriber growth. They actually lost subscribers, I think, uh, on Netflix. Uh, as well as higher expenses as those streaming wars start to heat up, you know, for, for video streaming anyway. Uh, so basically Netflix is seeing lower subscriber growth. Uh, they're seeing higher expenses as they compete with, you know, Paramount Plus, HBO Max, with Disney Plus. Uh, so higher expenses, lower subscriber growth, not a good picture for Netflix and other streamers. And I wonder if we start seeing that in, uh, you know, for Spotify as well. Okay, a company is, uh, is expected to report uh, a share loss of 42 Two cents a share, which would actually be less than it reported last year. So positive growth, 23% uh, revenue growth expected to 2.7 billion. Now the shares have sold off. Uh, they're down. They're they're down quite a bit with the rest of the growth stocks only trading for 3.3 times sales. So it's not expensive. But you know, I, I I just I still worry that management could say something about that slowdown in streaming, maybe higher expenses, and uh, and that could weigh on the stock when it reports on uh, Wednesday. Last, uh, last stock I'm watching here is Amazon. Amazon is going to report on Thursday. Shares basically flat for about the last 19 months, you know, and really the sell-off has accelerated this year. We can show you, uh, show you here the five-year chart. So you see it had a, you know, grew, grew along with the FANG stocks up through 2019, big boom in 2020, uh, you know, on the pandemic as everybody was locked down and buying their stuff on Amazon and then has been just doing nothing, right? Has done nothing since July since uh, June or July of 2020. It's actually uh, taken a big hit start of, uh, you know, end of last year, start of this year, along with the rest of the market. Uh, but now the shares are actually looking attractive. I think probably for the first time ever as a value investor, I can say shares of Amazon are looking cheap here. You know, it's now trading for 3.1 times on a sales basis, which is about a 20% discount from the five year average of 3.9 times. Okay, so Amazon over the past five years has traded the price has traded for 3.9 times the sales, the revenue of that year. Okay, it's now trading for 3.1 times, a 20% discount from that longer term average uh, and looking attractive on a valuation basis. Okay, so companies expected to do 10% uh, sales growth to $138 billion for this quarter when they report. Cloud services has been a real source of strength for other companies lately, uh, the, the other companies that have been reporting. And Amazon is obviously the leader in that space, obviously the leader in cloud services with, with its AWS. Uh, so I think that uh, that could be a potential surprise upside in earnings. Its dominance in e-commerce is, is really unmatched. And, uh, and I think, you know, investors can, can even value investors can finally start looking at Amazon as a, a long-term position, you know, because it is, a it is, a you know, obviously a, a great company, a good stock, but then also, uh, you know, also kind of, kind of, uh, value territory here. Now I want to, uh, before I open it up to Q and I, I just kind of want to talk about the market and, you know, uh, how to, how to think about this market and not get scared out of the market. Okay, one thing that really caught my eye last week was Robinhood's earnings. Uh, they actually lost investor or lost users. Okay, so Robinhood is now down uh, about a million users from its peak. It, it reported something like 18.3 million users last year, uh, right around the peak when everybody was using Robinhood. It is now down to about 17 million users. Okay, so a lot of people leaving Robinhood. Uh, we don't really know if those users, if those investors are going to other platforms or if they're just giving up on the market, right? So uh, so it's really interesting to see, you know, to see maybe if, if uh, users are, or if retail investors, you know, the, the main street investors, regular investors are really kind of abandoning stocks after this last year, after the growth stocks have given up, after, uh, you know, after the big sell-off over the last two months. Um, and then of course, you know, we get, we get all these YouTubers talking about selling their stocks you know, uh, and we won't call anyone out, but you, you, we got to put this into perspective here, folks. A lot of these YouTubers, I, I mean, they're 30 years old, which means they were what, 15, 16 years old, uh, in the last crash. I, I don't count 2020 as a stock market crash actually, because it was all of about four weeks, right? A real stock market crash, the real test of your, you know, of your guts, of your courage as an investor is to, is something like now is to watch your stocks go down over a, a, a year, you know, 
watching them lose lose value and and having the courage to say, you know what? I love this company. I love this stock. I think it's going to be the something that something is really going to grow in the future. Yes, stock the stock price is falling now. I'm going to do a dispassionate uh, you know, a dispassionate analysis, look at the numbers, look at what I think the company can do uh, and use that to buy or sell uh, buy or sell the shares. You know, not not get scared, not get uh, not get scared out of the market, not to stress out, uh, you know, when when we see the market fall down. But but you know, you you really you really haven't been through a stock market crash until you've been through one of these that where it, it's a series of months and even a year from the peak down to the low that big crash 20 percent plus 30 percent plus in the general market and even higher in some of these other stocks that's what really tests you and that's what really makes you a better investor so not necessarily I, I don't yeah and that doesn't to say that young investors can't be good investors because they haven't had that experience yet but I'd be very wary of listening to other you know other young investors or these these youtubers that are selling all their stocks, right? That are doing this kind of uh, this kind of stock trading positioning. Uh, and what you got to understand about them is they're going to make a hell of a lot more money off of their videos than they ever do on investing. Okay, these these guys they make millions of dollars off of YouTube, off of their the ad revenue on YouTube, as well as their courses. You know, if you watch a one one YouTuber in particular that says he sold off ninety eight percent of his stocks. Um, he, he goes through the whole video and then the last, probably about the last two minutes, he actually says what he did. He sold off his stocks and bought some put options or, or something like that. And he says, this, this is the part that really made me mad. Okay. You know, he can do what he wants with his stocks. It's his prerogative. He can even post it on YouTube, be a little sensational like that. That's fine. But what really made me mad is he says, I'm going to be very quick with this position. I'm going to be in and out, you know, and you won't know. He actually said, you won't know what I'm doing. Unless you, if you want to know what I'm doing, you, you buy this course, the thousand dollar stock investing course that he's making. So basically this sensational video of him selling 98% of the stocks and it's done very well for him. Uh, the video is getting you know, hundreds of thousands of views. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, but, but it's basically, it's just, you know, he's making money off the YouTube ad revenue. He's pushing people into his stock investing course, right? Just because they don't want to miss out on, you know, his some kind of genius that he has in investing. Okay. But if you look at some of these, you know, some of their experience, okay. Starting as real estate agents or whatever, they've got maybe five years in the market, right? Just, I mean, be wary of, uh, of the, the advice you get here on YouTube. Okay. You know, not necessarily that these are bad people or, or I want to manipulate people or anything, but sensationalism sells. Okay. Sex sells on, on YouTube. Okay. And the, the most sensational, the most crazy they can make their videos, uh, and, and the, the most they can make you scared. Uh, it just means more money in their pockets. Cause you know, if, if you're dependent on him for your stock investing advice, you're going to be watching every single video. And that means more money, more money for them. I want to give you a couple of examples of this, um, uh, really some, some of the some of the the reason why you can't just sell out of stocks right now especially now that stocks are down you know uh, we're actually going to update uh, review this so so I think you know stocks are up you know stocks are actually up right now um, started the start of the market market's been open for about 22 minutes uh, Nasdaq Nasdaq up almost one percent right it was up last it was flat last week up this week. Uh, which really means if you sold out, if you took the advice and sold all your stocks, you know, at the beginning of last week, you're now, you locked in that, that 15, 20% loss in stocks. And, uh, and now you're wondering, okay, stocks are going up now. When do I get back in? Okay. Um, so do not get scared out of the market. You know, uh, some, a few examples here uh, to keep in mind. Okay. Amazon went public in 1997, right? To the height of the stock market, the, the dot-com bubble, a market value of just $438 million and reached $106 a share by December of 99. Okay. And we, of course, we know what happens after that. You know, $106 at its peak in December of 99, lost 94% of its value, fell all the way down from $106. Now imagine this, Amazon falling from $106 a share to $5.97 by December, by September of 2001. Okay, 94 investors in that stock lost 94% of their value. And of course, you know, they did relatively well against a lot of these other dot com companies that just went completely bankrupt. Okay, but lost 94% of their uh, value. Shares are now worth over $2,800. We just looked at that uh, earlier, uh, $2,800 per share, 466 times 
that low. Okay, six dollars a share in September two thousand one jumped four hundred sixty six times that. Okay, you know even if you bought at the nine at the peak in nineteen ninety nine one hundred six dollars, you were one of those unlucky souls that was in Amazon in December 19, 1999, the worst possible time, $106 a share, you would still make 27 per times your money, 17% annualized return over the past, you know, what, what is that, um, 22, 23 years, right? 27 times your money. Uh, to, and that's if you bought in at the very worst possible time, you had that 94% loss, but you held with those shares because you believed in the company. You believed Amazon was going to be the leader in e-commerce, which it is now. Uh, and you know, it really goes to show you, you cannot, you cannot get scared out of this market. Okay. One more example here, lending tree uh, and lending tree is really interesting because it's, uh, it's kind of similar to some of these new growth stocks that just went IPO over the last year, right? A lot of new, a lot of growth stocks, a lot of IPOs over the last year that are now down 30, 40, 50%, right? Lending Tree actually went IPO in August 2008. Okay. And Lending Tree is a, uh, you know, mortgage lender, right? So obviously 2008, 2007, 2008, huge time for Lending Tree and mortgage lenders. Stock price was just off the hook. It was crazy, crazy high, high valuation. Went IPO August 2008, um, before the worst of that house housing related sell-off, right? Um, $9.25 a share in 2008 when it IPO'd plunged 83% in just four months in 2008. Four months, investors lost 83% of their money in that stock to $1.55 a share, right? Now, by May of the next year, okay, so, uh, you know, so so lost that uh, August, uh, August 2008, four months, uh, actually, okay, so, so August, uh, August, September, October, November, December, so by December, it was $1.55 a share. December uh, 2008, $1.55 a share, uh, lost 83% by May of the next year. So about five months later, you know, uh, back up to $11.58 a share, 640% return, six times, seven times your money uh, just by sticking with that stock. If you believed in the company, sticking with it. If And now it's at $115 a share, okay? So another 74 times your money in less than 14 years. That is annualized return yearly return of 40% on that stock. If you just stuck with it, you didn't sell out of fear, you didn't get scared out of the market or stressed out of the market. Um, and that's, I think that's a lot of what you see in a lot of these growth stocks right now. Okay, we talked about PayPal, or what well, we talked about SoFi, we've talked about Teladoc, uh, the stocks that yes, were und undeniably expensive, and way more expensive than they ever should have been, um, you know, in February of last year before that, um, but now are at attractive valuations. Uh, they, these are future growth stocks, and I just do not think you need. I do not want you to get scared out of this market because uh, you know because you see some sensational headlines or uh, or thumbnails or, or YouTube videos, uh, you know, on YouTube. Uh, one of the reasons why I think I think we could be seeing that kind of uh, you know that kind of bottom in stocks. We saw a big that big capitulation move uh, by retail investors on Monday. Again, capitulation is just an idea in the market that says when you get that point of max fear, okay, blood in the streets, right? Um, you that point of max fear where everybody just gives up. The last investors that that were holding on, saying, "Come on, please, God, I just want to get even. I just want to get even on these stocks." Uh, you know, when they eventually just say, "I just can't take it." You know, I don't need the stress. I'm going to sell at a loss. I don't care. That is capitulation. And, and of course, when that happens, you know, there's nobody else left to sell. Okay, when everybody that, that is going to sell has sold, you only have buyers in there, and uh, that's when you get the the bottom in stock prices. That's when you get stock prices go up. And we started seeing that, I think, in uh, you know something something like that last Monday. At one point, uh, the Nasdaq was down five percent by noon in a single day, five percent. Um, JP Morgan actually reported they had more than one point three six billion dollars in sell orders by noon. Okay, that's more than four standard deviations. Okay, which you know probably doesn't mean much unless you're a numbers nerd like me. But I nerd out on this stuff, right? Four standard deviations above the normal. That 1.36 billion dollar sell orders. That is way above normal. That is you know unheard of territory for for sell orders. And uh, you know so you really did see that's what drove the stocks down five percent. Is all those people selling just giving up? You know, so that is a sign of capitulation. Now, the larger money managers, the institutional investors, hedge funds, private equity, uh, you know, mutual funds, things like that, they really haven't sold quite as much. So, 
if we, you know, we would have to see that to see a real definitive sign of capitulation, both the retail investors and the institutional investors selling. Okay, that would be more like that 20% down from the peaks. But, uh, but definitely, you know, definitely seeing some real capitulation in retail investing and uh, and some real support for this market. So, you know, again, I don't just don't want you to get scared out of this market because we're actually finding, you know, for the economy, for the the data coming out of the economy, we're actually finding some some real support here you know so i want to i want to open it up to uh to q a a little bit here uh, i know this one's running a little bit long but uh check out what uh what some of the questions are here uh let me know let me know if you got any questions i'm gonna scroll back up see what we got here <clears throat> see a uh uh, intermediate handyman, five dollar super chat. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, it says SoFi and Palantir. Actually, just talked about SoFi. I don't. Maybe you weren't. You weren't in the uh, the live stream dirt at that point. Palantir haven't really looked. Palantir is you know it's it's obviously one of the one of those growth stocks. Um, and let's let's actually look at that. Uh, I can I can bring up Palantir now. Understand here. Uh, we haven't PLTR right. Palantir Technologies. Now, I haven't done a whole lot of research in this, and I'll tell you why. One of the things I haven't done research in, because if you still, if you look at this, the statistics, uh, you know, if you still look at the, the price to sales, it's still trading for 16.6 .6 times on a price to sales basis. So, you know, especially after the huge sell off in growth stocks that we've seen, uh, I want to see a stock under 10, 10 times price to sales. That is still extremely expensive, or that, I wouldn't say extremely expensive. That is still expensive uh, for a growth stock. Uh, it's really when a stock gets under 10 times on a price to sales basis that I start saying, okay, you know, what is the growth in this stock? What is the future of this company? And, uh, you know, should it be something that I'm looking at now? So the reason why I haven't really looked much at Palantir, uh, you know, and it is, it is a very strong growing company. I mean, I have no doubt that this company is going to uh, you know change the world as far as um, data analytics and, and what it's doing, but you know it is just still so expensive that I don't know when it gets there. You know, and and I could be wrong. It could be something like an Amazon uh, or like a Tesla that I just did not invest in for so long because those stocks were perennially uh, extremely expensive, uh, but they they just kept on surprising on the upside to growth. Uh, so I could be wrong on that, but. Then again, you know, I've been uh, just being conservative in this in this kind of growth stock investing has kept me from a lot of other stocks. Basically, it kept me from investing in a lot of these stocks, you know, in February of last year when they hit their peaks. You know, a lot of the Teladocs, the SoFi, the, um, you know, all of those ARK K, uh, you know, ARK Innovation Fund stocks that were trading for 20 and 30 and 40 times on a price to sales basis, you know, that that conservative nature uh, of investing in growth stocks kept me out of those stocks. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy that I did right now, you know, so again, I usually look for that price to sales ratio no higher than 10 times for a growth stock, then I'll start looking at, okay, what is the growth? Uh, you know, even if even if it's still at 10 times price to sales, what is the growth? How long does it take to get into that to grow into that valuation? And what do I think of the company? So yeah, I'm sorry, I really can't tell you a whole lot about Palantir because I just haven't started looking at it because it is still so expensive on that price to sales basis. Uh, obviously, SoFi just talked about it. It's something entirely different. If you look at the uh, the statistics on that, you know, it's uh, it's trading now trading for price to sales. Well, it's now up a little bit because it, it has come up, came up 7% so far today. Uh, so it has come up past that 10 times. I, I think I was in it at something like nine times uh, on a price to sales basis last week when I started, when I bought my shares, when I started buying in. Um, but yeah, you know, again, this is the future of banking and they have got a, an excellent competitive advantage in that uh, financial services, digital financial services space uh, with their banking license that they just got last week. Uh, so I think that that was a, a very good time to start picking up shares. I think you can still look at this stock. Uh, you know, it's still it's it is 11.6 times on a price to sales basis. So getting a little bit more expensive again. But again, they are growing, you know, growing revenue by 30, 30 to 40 percent a year. They're going to continue to do that for years to come. I think uh, they've got a great balance sheet, very strong, uh, you know, very strong positioned in that that uh, that 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 fintech uh, idea. OK, uh, what else do we have here? Saw another uh, super chat from Ivan. Uh, where are you, Ivan? I saw you. I saw you there, but I, I missed it. There it is. Uh, 
<clears throat> so 100 rubles super chat i appreciate that thank you i uh, actually got to respond to your email still uh just had a lot of a lot of emails come through over the weekend so haven't uh, haven't responded to that but i will get to it uh great steam as always check your email any news for crypto what are your thoughts on technical analysis for stocks and crypto okay a uh, couple of questions there uh first technical analysis on stocks and crypto uh technical analysis for crypto i really haven't really haven't gotten that much into it i know I mean, basically what you're going to see if you're if you're a crypto investor or thinking about investing in crypto all you're going to see on yahoo finance a lot of these other streams is that kind of technical analysis right uh, because that's a lot of what people are doing right it's easy people just basically looking at the past patterns in the charts uh past uh past prices that kind of thing and trying to say okay you know what if it happens now the same thing that happened in the past this is what's going to happen this is the price for that and i kind of hate it right because there is just not that much data we've only got you know what not even not even uh, a little over 10 years of pricing on bitcoin less uh, less time on pricing for some of these other cryptocurrencies uh, so you really don't have a whole lot to go on that technical analysis basis. But you're only going to see, you're always going to see on these articles, people are going to say, you know what, if uh, Bitcoin can keep that 38 level, that $38,000 level, that's support and it's going to go to 40. And if it can go to 40, it'll go to 45. Or, or you know, if it doesn't hold that and it goes to 35, then it could drop to 30. You know, nobody really knows. So they're kind of grasping at straws. A lot of these are just content. People, you know, people have to get an article out to, to get published and to make money. So that's what they're doing. They're, they're grasping at straws uh, in these price charts to try to figure out, okay, where is Bitcoin going next? You can't do it. You can't do it for crypto. Uh, I, I mean, you know, you look, none, of these, none of these predictions have been right. Uh, so I just don't think technical, technical analysis works very well with crypto. I do like technical analysis uh, slightly better in stocks. We do have the course with Thomas Carbo that, that is out. Kind of a full three-hour course on technical analysis in stocks. And what I like to use now, a lot of people, you know, traders, that is their main tool for tech, technical analysis. That is their main tool, you know, using these charting patterns and these, and these uh, you know, pricing patterns. Uh, technical analysis is the only thing they use. You know, if you're, if you're investing in less than, you know, uh, holding a stock for less than a day, less than a week, it is all about the technical analysis. So you need something like that, right? For longer term, it's much more the fundamentals, right? So what I use technical analysis for, since I'm a longer term investor, I just use it for more like the buy points, right? I'll use technical analysis to see, okay, is this stock overbought or oversold? What's the RSI indicator for it? You know, and use that as my entry point, right? You know, so if I'm saying uh, maybe I'll invest in uh, more shares of SoFi or more shares of PayPal or something, I'll look at some of the technical points on it. You know, I'll look at, okay, the RSI, is this oversold right now? Uh, if it is, that can confirms my buy. That confirms that I want to buy it right now. If it's overbought uh, or some of these other technicals, you know, maybe look a, a little bit overbought, then I'll say, you know what? I like the stock, but I'm going to keep watching it for the next week or two to see if maybe it comes down. Maybe if it comes down off of those overbought levels. So I will use technical analysis as a confirmation of my long-term investing strategy. Okay. Uh, so that's what, that's what I do for technical analysis. Yes. in stocks, no in crypto, uh, news for crypto. You know, again, you've got to look past this this near term pain uh, and look at those longer term fundamentals. And I, I mean, you know, it is hard not being positive. I've got I've got probably about 20, 30 percent of my net wealth of my portfolio in cryptocurrencies, a little over five hundred thousand. Um, so it's about 20 percent, a little under 20 percent of my net wealth in cryptocurrency, uh, a little over five hundred thousand dollars in Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, ADA, uh, Polygon, Matic, a few of the smaller coins, mostly in Ethereum and Bitcoin. Right. Because the the longer term fundamentals are very strong, they are still there. You know, we still see an increase in users, uh, and really that's what that's what drives uh, drives the prices for these. Okay, there there's our intrinsic value that has to do with the use cases of them. The use has to use with, with use with decentralized finance, uh, store of value arguments, things like that. That intrinsic value that is there. But right now, most of it is in just that use case, that, that network value, okay? The, the number of people investing in it, uh, you know, holding Bitcoin, holding Ethereum and other, other tokens, okay? And that's just, it's just undeniable, okay? It is, you know, you can get people like Warren Buffett that says it's it rat, it's rat poison squared and stuff like that. And I think it just shows a, a real naive, uh, a naive outlook on it or some, somebody that really hasn't looked at these underlying fundamentals. You know, one of the things I've been watching is just the emerging market growth in cryptocurrencies. You got a lot of these emerging markets that with inflation of, you know, you think it's bad in the U.S. with inflation of 7%. Turkey is inflation of 40% year over year. Um, 
Venezuela just got off of having triple digit inflations, quadruple digit inflations year over year. Okay, so a lot of these emerging market countries, people are buying cryptocurrencies, you know, holding cryptocurrencies, holding Bitcoin, holding Ethereum to protect their money. Okay, even after something like 45% drop from its peak in Bitcoin, it is still about even uh, in terms of that, uh, that Turkish lira, okay, because the Turkish lira has fallen so much. Uh, so you get a huge adoption in these emerging market countries. You've obviously got a huge adoption from financial services here in the U.S. Uh, banks starting off for crypto services. Visa actually put out in the Bowtie Nation uh, issue last night that went out last night, the weekly. Um, Visa actually reported uh, something like two and a half billion dollars uh, used, uh, you know, uh, credit on their, their crypto related cards, right? So users, they just started offering crypto related credit cards, right? Where you earn bonus crypto, right? Cash back in cryptocurrencies. They just started offering that last year. And, uh, you know, the, the first three months, you know, or the last three months uh, that, that they've reported was $2.5 billion. It was 70% of the entire last year's spending on those cards. It was just in three months, okay? So people are using these cards, people are getting involved in cryptocurrency. Um, obviously these exchanges, you've got Coinbase, you've got uh, FTX, all of these exchanges, these crypto.com that are buying stadiums, right? They're buying the naming rights to stadiums. They have tons of money. They have billions and billions of dollars in money that they are now spending on advertising, on marketing to bring more people in, into cryptocurrency. And that is just driving this use case. Okay, so even though cryptocurrency is down, uh, Bitcoin is down, uh, I actually think it's probably up today, up quite a bit uh, today, I think probably with the, uh, the, the risk on sentiment in the market, uh, you know, so even though it's down, so Bitcoin's actually 36, 37,600 right now, so down slightly over the past 24 hours. But uh, even though it's down like 45% from its peak, you still have that greater adoption of it. You're going to see that throughout the year and throughout the years to come. Uh, we're actually, I'm actually starting, uh, starting a, a series of videos uh, from the ARK Invest Big Ideas report that they put out some great information, great research on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that I'm going to be covering. I don't see it going to a million dollars. Okay, Kathy Wood now says that Bitcoin can go to a million dollars each by 2030. Uh, and they actually show you, you know, where they get that valuation estimate from. So I'm going to be breaking that down. I don't think it gets to a million dollars. It's going to be a long time before it gets to 500,000, I think. But Hell, even if it gets to 300,000, if it gets to 370,000, that's 10 times your money still. And I think that is very possible looking at this growth and looking at some of the fundamentals behind it. So, you know, you know where I stand on cryptocurrency. I think you can put in, uh, you know, put in two to 5% of your net wealth in cryptocurrency. If it does go that 10 times, then uh, I mean, you've just made a 50% return on your entire net wealth portfolio just from that little tiny part. Okay. If it doesn't go anywhere, if it goes down or anything, you really haven't lost anything. Two to 5% of your net wealth in it. It's, uh, you know, if it, if it doesn't do anything, you haven't lost that much. If it does take off though, like I think it should and like I think it will, then, uh, then you're going to be happy that you did. So, uh, so that's that's where I'm at on crypto. Uh, obviously, I don't I don't suggest you you go into it quite as much as I have. You know, put put as much as, as I have into it, but I still think you, you need some kind of uh, some something in it. What else we got here? Uh, okay, looking for some of the questions here. Okay. how to buy platinum. So Heaven Earth wants to know how to buy platinum. Uh, I, as far as I know, I mean, there's probably an ETF there. I mean, and we can actually search platinum. Uh, platinum group metals. And here, what I'm doing here is just basically just, uh, just searching platinum on uh, Yahoo Finance and you get platinum group metals, which I imagine is a, uh, is a metals miner. So you see the drop down, Platinum Group Metals, Impala Platinum Holdings. Uh, that's a pink sheet stock, so I'd be careful about that. Here's one, Aberdeen Standard Physical Platinum Shares ETF. Okay, so that's gonna be like your GLD, your, your gold ETF that's gonna hold physical platinum, but you don't have to actually take delivery of, your, of it yourself. So the PPLT, I would look at that. Uh, if you're into futures, if you're into the futures market, then you obviously you buy platinum through the, the futures market like that. Uh, but haven't really done a whole lot on, on platinum. Uh, uh, Moin, Mo, Moin the City, Moin the City 3 wants to know a uh, price evaluation for Coinbase. 
Uh, you know, and I actually did just after Coinbase IPO'd, I did a uh, video on uh, on Coinbase comp compared to investment in Coinbase to Bitcoin to Ethereum. I actually like direct investing in uh, you know in the coins itself. Okay, not saying that Coinbase can't do well. Uh, I think they're they're innovating and they're bringing different products into it. But a couple of things worries me about Coinbase. Okay, one is you know you just look at other look at stock investing platforms. They are now driven to zero on their fees, right? Z Commission-free stock investing, all that kind of stuff. Coinbase obviously making a lot of money off of its uh, off of its crypto trading fees, right? Because cryptocurrency still has a lot of those trading fees uh, that you pay when you buy cryptocurrency. And Coinbase is actually one of the highest. You know, I do have some money on crypt on Coinbase just because. Uh, it's easier, you know. I can I can move money from my bank to Coinbase, whereas I can't move money from my bank to uh, to to BlockFi, which is where I hold most of my cryptocurrency. Uh, so I have to use it use Coinbase to get money from my bank to Coinbase, and then to BlockFi. Uh, so so I do still have some money on Coinbase, but the the fees are extremely high. And what I think you see, you know, just like we saw in stock investing platforms over the years, is those fees come down. You know, they get more competitive. All these cryptocurrency exchanges get more competitive. Those fees start coming down, and that's really going to hurt, hurt Coinbase unless it has started to get other these other products, which is starting to do that now. Uh, so that that's going to be supportive, but I think it's a real hit to uh, to its revenue. Uh, the thing that I don't like about Coinbase, though, the real the main point why I'm investing in cryptocurrency instead of cryptocurrency exchanges like Coinbase is because it's kind of a, a, a lopsided scenario, right? You know, cryptocurrency, for Coinbase to do well, for Coinbase investors to make money, cryptocurrency has to do well. You know, there is no getting around it. Okay, if Bitcoin and Ethereum and a lot of these other cryptocurrencies do not do well, if they do not rebound and make people money, then nobody's going to be using Coinbase. Nobody, you don't need Coinbase if you don't need crypto. Okay, so for Coinbase to do well, cryptocurrency has to do well. The, the opposite isn't necessarily true. OK, uh, so if I'm in if I if I own Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin can take off doesn't necessarily mean Coinbase is going to do well. OK, if Bitcoin takes off, yes, Coinbase is going to do what uh, is going to do. OK, probably going to see higher revenues, but you've got that competition in exchanges. You've got management errors, maybe in Coinbase, whatever happens in Coinbase uh, could limit how Coinbase shares do, you know, apart from from Bitcoin. OK, so, you know, that's that's just the reason why I invest in directly in the cryptocurrencies instead of the exchanges. OK, um, not necessarily the same with stock investing platforms, you know, with E-Trade or uh, Bank of America. Merrill Lynch has a as an investing platform. Those those are a little bit more closely related to stock investing and banking and things like that. So, so I mean, that's just that's just what I'm looking at as far as shares of Coinbase. You know, obviously, uh, obviously has done very poorly on uh, because cryptocurrency has come down, uh, but you do have the kind of that one-sided relationship uh, there. Mm, what else is Thank you, Nvidia. Just kind of scrolling through to see uh, the questions here. Uh, you know, what? Uh, trying to see what uh, what questions do we have. What do you think about Shiba? You know, Brian wants to know about Shiba, Shiba Inu, right? Uh, and and I assume kind of Dogecoin, kind of those meme uh, coins, right? And, and again, I don't invest in, in the uh, the other coins. Okay, I invest. Uh, like I said, I've got five coins. I've got Bitcoin, Ethereum is the the largest part of my portfolio, a crypto portfolio. It's probably about forty percent of my crypto uh, assets. Bitcoin is a close second, maybe 20, 30 percent, something like that. And then I've got smaller amounts in the Polygon Matic, in the ADA, so Cardano, as well as, uh, you know, the Aave. OK, so the AAVE. OK, uh, and the reason why I don't invest, the reason why I invest in those and not all these other coins is because I want coins that have real fundamental and intrinsic value. OK, a use case value. OK, Bitcoin, obviously, it, its value is in that network and the people using it. Its value is in, uh, you know, some kind of a store of value. I know it's not a great store of value, obviously, but there is an argument to be made, you know, as a competition for gold, as an inflation hedge, things like that. So there is some investment thesis for Bitcoin uh, as far as, you know, those those other use cases. Right. Um, for these others, for Ethereum, Cardano, uh, Polygon Matic, for the Aave, the use case is the growth in blockchain technology. Okay, you've got uh, you know you've got decentralized finance. You've got the way blockchain is being used to uh, to really uh, democratize and uh, and secure records across the economy through healthcare. You know every every industry, right? So the intrinsic value of these 
is really in that, you know, is in the, the, the currency, you know, is in the coins needed to back up those smart contracts and, and those other things. Okay. So that's the investment case in those, those main coins. And that's why I invest in them because I'm a long-term investor and I, I follow this fundamental analysis for some of these other coins though. I mean, Shiba Inu, uh, Dogecoin, the only reason to invest in those is this, if you think, you know, the more investors are going to buy them. It's that, it's that momentum investing kind of idea uh, that, you know, I mean, if you want to do technical analysis on them, if you want to invest, you know, to because you think uh, Elon Musk is going to tweet or something, that's, I mean, that's something you can do. But for me, it's just not an investing thesis. It's not a, it's not a reason. It's not a fundamental support of those coins uh, to just hope that uh, more investors are going to buy into them, you know. So, so I, I really can't talk uh, talk about the Shibu, Shiba or the Doge or or all those because I just don't think they have fundamental uh, investment theses uh, supporting those those coins. <clears throat> what else? Okay, Heather. Heather wants to know about what are your thoughts on Discovery, uh, D D I S C A, and plans on merging with AT and T. Uh, actually, it's not merging with AT and T. Uh, what, it, what is happening? And this is actually why I bought I bought shares of AT and T about a month ago. Uh, AT and T ticker T down last week a little down about seven percent on its earnings. But before that, over the past month, it was up like fifteen percent. And I really think AT and T has found its bottom. So I bought shares. Uh, still a, a great dividend. Even after the split, they're going to lower the dividend, but it's still going to be a, you know five percent plus dividend, right? So it's still going to be a great dividend. What they're doing, AT and T is actually spinning off its. Uh, it's media segment, right? So the Time Warner segment, it is spinning that off. That is going to merge with Discovery, right? So it's going to form like a Discovery, Time Warner, something like that. It's going to be a media streaming uh, company, right? Now, AT&T in this deal, AT&T is getting like $80 billion cash, right? That it's going to use to pay down its debt, which has always been the big problem for AT&T. It sw swooped in and, and bought these DirecTV, it bought uh, Time Warner, paid way too much for those companies, uh, put on tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in debt. And that's really been what what is weighing on the shares of AT&T. But it's getting $80 billion in that deal to pay off debt. It's still going to own a lot of this other company. So it's got still got, you know, some kind of a, a position and exposure to this streaming company. Uh, you know, so so it's it's a very good deal for AT and T Discovery. Uh, and, uh, you know, Discovery is going to merge with that Time Warner I'd be worried about that though. Uh, generally, you know, generally when spinoffs happen or, or when uh, you know breakups happen, then then I mean the, the shares of the companies can do well because management is now focused on that one singular line of business. Okay, AT and T managers for years they've had to deal with telecom, they've had to deal with streaming, they've had to deal with uh, you know direct TV satellite, right? It's just too much for them to concentrate on. So yes, managers will be able to focus on media or telecom, right? Different companies. But the streaming business, it is just so expensive right now. Look at what you saw with Netflix last week. Netflix lost subscribers, higher expenses, uh, just a bad position to be in for a streaming media stock. And I think so I think Discovery, uh, Time Warner, that new company that's going to be formed, it's going to have it's going to have some some headwinds against it from the start because, you know, it's obviously doesn't have the name cachet that uh, Netflix does or that Disney Plus does. Uh, so it's really, you know, I think it's, I think it's the Paramount Paramount uh, streaming network, right? That they're selling the Discovery and uh, and Time Warner, right? Um, maybe HBO Max they own, right? Uh, so, you know, they're they're doing okay, uh, but is they're 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 having to compete with Netflix, with Disney Plus, with all that. Uh, so I think you know they're going to start. They're going to see those um, expenses higher, you know, on that streaming wars competition, and it's going to be it's going to be tough. So wouldn't necessarily be buying shares of the new company Discovery Time Warner, uh, but I am buying shares of AT and T. Uh, they had bought them about a uh, about a month ago. So I think it's a good company. They can now focus on telecom. They're going to get a lot of cash in that deal, and uh, you know it's going to be a very stable cash flow company, uh, like it was once in the past. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, uh, Positive Mike wants to know about Shopify. Uh, again, probably one that I, I haven't really looked at lately, but it you know would be one that's probably on my radar. Uh, it's one of these growth stocks, right? So that's uh, that's Mike. I think Mike, the positive Mike that wants to know about Shopify. Uh, so we'll look at that up 8%. So we're seeing a real big bounce in the growth stocks this year or so. It's come down 
Uh, this one started coming down much later, though. It, it actually peaked in November uh, 1520. It's down 940 uh, today, uh, even after that 8% pop. So it's it's still down about 30% from the peak, though. Uh, but kind of surprising that it was able to keep running, you know, through November when most of the growth stocks, you know, started selling off in, uh, you know, in, in February there. Uh, so it's 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 done well. It's up to eight percent today. Let's look at the statistics, though. Let's look at what the uh, the price to earn price to sales are. See, I mean, this is this is what I'm talking about. There is a real difference, and there's there's another difference that you have to understand with growth stocks as well that we can cover. We'll, I'll look at that next. But but first of all, you look at this price to sales, and that's just it's just hard to get into a stock even after a thirty percent uh, plunge in the shares to pay 26 times its its sales. Okay, you know, for for normal growth stocks again. Uh, 10% or, or 10 times on a price to sales basis uh, is is kind of the top. Uh, for most stocks, you know, for most stocks, you want to pay no more than two or three or four times sales. Uh, so, you know, I, I think uh, I think 26 times is just hard to justify that. Another thing you want to look at these growth stocks, and this is what I'm, this is one, that, something that I've talked about in the past, uh, in the past couple of weeks, the real difference in growth stocks that you want to be looking at uh, when you're trying to decide, okay, are these now cheap enough to buy? Can I get into them? Is just the difference between, and you're going to hear a lot of people talk, call these quality growth stocks, okay, buying quality names rather than some of the other ones. I think Jim Cramer is talking a lot about this, uh, you know, as far as uh, the difference, okay, so, and what he's talking about and what everybody's talking about here is profitable companies. Companies that, yes, they may have just went IPO last year or the last couple of years. Yes, they are growth stocks. They are still very expensive, but they are already making money. And that's uh, so that's something you do see here with Shopify. Uh, you do see the profit margin, 81%, right? So it is making money. You can go to, if you go to the summary page on Yahoo Finance here, you can see that it is it is net income positive. Okay, here's the earnings per share for the company. Uh, reported uh, two dollars and eighty three cents a share. Positive earnings in the uh, for Q two. Uh, missed earnings expectations last quarter for a dollar, but still still a dollar for uh, positive earnings. So they are making money. You know that you compare that to a lot of other companies. And you know I'm not picking on Palantir, but we'll look, talk about Palantir again. You know if you look at something like Palantir, you know so so Shopify. It's expensive, but it is making money already. It is, you know, actually creating, generating that cash flow and that positive, uh, positive economic profit. You look at, okay, well, that's surprising. I guess uh, Palantir is making money. It is net income positive uh, here. So maybe not the best example of this. But if you look at, uh, look at something else. Let's look at, I guess, Fastly. Okay, and you know, Fastly is is a stock that we were in last year. Made pretty good money off of it. It has come down quite a bit, but this is a growth stock. Okay. Trading pretty expensively, uh, but it is not making money. Okay. So, um, minus nine, we got nine, 12, that's 21, uh, 30, 36, 36, 47. So it has lost 47 cents per share over the last year. Okay. So, you know, that is really the difference here in these growth stocks that you need to be watching for what, and what you'll, what you're going to hear people talk about when they talk about quality versus, you know, quality growth stocks versus everything else. You're going to be talking about companies that are actually making money that are profitable. Yes, they are expensive, but they are profitable and uh, and they still have that growth. Okay, so Shopify, Shopify is doing 46% revenue growth on a year over year basis. It is profitable. You know, it's got 81% uh, profit margin. So very strong fundamentally. It's just, you know, it's we still get back to that price to sales that, uh, you know, again, it's things like that Palantir. It's things like Shopify that if they end up being like an Amazon or like a Tesla, a Tesla that have always been expensive, you know, you could never, you know, Amazon is just now like, what would we say, 3.1 times on a price to sales basis? Before the last few years, you could never buy Amazon for less than like 10 times sales. It was always too expensive to look at. Uh, and I missed out on it for a long time. That's it proved me wrong. You know, if Shopify is like that, if Pal Palantir is like that, then it could prove me wrong. But again, by keeping that conservative nature on these growth stocks by saying, no, anything over 10 times price to sales, I'm just not going to look at it. I'm going to be a little bit more conservative pick my targets, uh, you know, pick my stock buys aggressively or conservatively and uh, and not fall into those biggest traps. You know, it really paid off over the last year. Um, 
And when those stocks were up, you know, 20, 30, 40 times price to sales, it saved me from a lot of losses. And I think it's a very good, a very good rule to have as far as uh, some of these stocks. So, you know, it's a uh, Shopify, it's, it's, it's got a good position in e-commerce. I, I think it, it could be a very good company. It's just too expensive right now for, for my taste. Uh, and, and I think you can, I think you can wait uh, on that. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, yeah, I see a lot of, you know, thoughts on DocuSign. DocuSign is another one that, that I've actually bought, bought last, late last year, uh, D-O-C-U. And DocuSign, you know, maybe I'm biased because I use a lot of DocuSign. Uh, you know, as, a, as, you know, someone that works online, someone that works uh, freelance and, and independent, then, uh, you know, all the contracts I get from companies, from sponsors or, or whatever, uh, you know, from agencies, they are all through DocuSign. So, you know, DocuSign is really just, just leading in that digital uh, contract uh, space. They're also, they're expanding into notaries, you know, digital notary, things like that. So, you know, I think they have a, a real strong position in what will be, you know, the uh, kind of the, the way we interact as far as contracts in the future. Uh, so I did, uh, let me see, I did pick up shares after this big drop. It was after this big drop is right around, actually, my cost base is about $137. So, you know, it's down a little bit now, but, uh, but that's well off of the highs there. Uh, so I did pick up shares uh, late last year in late November when it had that that big drop. Uh, if you look at this the shares here, you know now still still about eleven times price to sales. So kind of at that very peak of what I would even consider looking at it. Okay, you know I did pick up shares, uh, maybe broke my rule a little bit, ten times price to sales. So so you know it's 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 a rule to be bent. Uh, but not necessarily broken. So I did pick up shares right around 11 times on a price to sales basis. Uh, a little expensive, but you know, I mean, again, growing revenue 40% per year. Uh, you look at you look at the analysis. You look at what uh, what analysts are expecting. Analysts are expecting 40% uh, revenue growth this year, 25% next year. I think it'll beat that. 2.6 billion dollars uh, in sales next year. So you know, if we get if we get that. You got 23.88 market cap right now divided by 2.6. I think it goes 2.65 at least next year. I mean, that's down to nine times price to sales. So it's back in that in that uh, green light uh, territory where, where you start to look at a company. Uh, so so yeah, I do own shares of DocuSign. I think it's a, uh, you know, it's, it has that that first mover's advantage on uh, really that contact contract area uh, in the digital in the digital space. Um, <clears throat> We are we are about an hour and a half into this thing. Uh, if I didn't get to your question, go ahead and ask it in the comments below, and I'll try to get to that uh, the rest of the day. Uh, I want to thank everybody for for joining me on another one of these live streams. Going to do these every Monday, 9 a.m. Get you ready for the market uh, and uh, what we're looking at for the rest of the the rest of the week. Um, be sure to check out the videos this week. Got a video every day now, Tuesday through Friday. Check those out, and uh, I will see you in the next week.